Somebody else comes up the path. I can't wait for 10 seconds. Morning, everybody. Lovely to see you here. Great to be here. Have you all watching online? It's good to see you. No, you're there. And I must admit, I had to Google this morning because I couldn't quite remember what this wet stuff was that was coming down. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's quite nice to have the rain. I haven't got any notices. They just told me anything, so I guess they're just the same as they are on your notice sheet. And uh, I do have a funny little story for you. I don't want anybody to be offended by it. It's just for fun, actually. I don't need those. I did in big enough writing. One day, in a Sunday school, a teacher asked, if I sell my house and my car, have a jumble sale, and give all the money to the church, will that get me into heaven? No, all the children answered. Uh, if I cleaned the church every day, mowed the lawns, and kept everything neat and tidy, would that get me into heaven? Again, the children answered, no. Well, he continued, then how will I get into heaven? And a five-year-old boy shouted, you've got to be dead. <laughs> <laughs> so in all we do this morning, as we gather to, in all we do, and I was hoping that Susan, I know you're watching, and I wish you were here because I want you to read this and translate. Does anybody speak Spanish? Read that first one, but that's okay. I thought that's the other one. So we're, jo <laughs> we're joining with people all over the world to bring glory to God this morning, and we do that through our worship and our prayers and reading the Bible and listening to it being explained to us and our very faith and lifting the name of Jesus high. That's how we bring glory to God. So we're going to do that in our first worship song. Thank you, Pete. She's done. Oh, 
Sorry, it's just the right time. <laughs> Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before our Lord, our maker, for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. We prayed um, in, the, in the lounge for the children, and uh, they haven't arrived yet, but we're still going to pray. We're still going to pray for them, so let's do that. Lord, we thank you that uh, you brought all those children along to us, and Lord, and we miss them now, they're moving away. But um, and Chris was praying, the Lord, you've been so faithful in sending families and children, and we just pray that that will happen again, Lord, that we'll have young children coming in, perhaps older children coming to join us, so they can find out all about you. <coughs> Amen. It'd be great to have some more children here. There's going to be time set aside later on, um, give you an opportunity to come and share something with us, perhaps something that... Um, God's put on your heart, perhaps a word of testimony, a scripture. So, um, yeah, you can prepare in yourself for that. So Trevor's going to come and read the Bible passage to us today. And then as soon as he's finished, we're going to um, use two songs to declare, to declare what we believe. Thanks, Trevor. Just 1 to 18, is that right? Okay, if you're following in the Pew Bible, it's page 1068. Uh, so it's John chapter 5. Some time later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for a feast of the Jews. Now there is in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, 
and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. colonnades. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie. The blind, the lame, the paralysed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he'd been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, Do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. <clears throat> the day on which this took place was a Sabbath. And so the Jews said to the man who'd been healed, It is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, The man who made me well said to me, Pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, Who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. So, Jesus, so because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jews persecuted him. Jesus said to them, My father is always at his work to the very day, and I too am working. For this reason the Jews tried all the harder to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God.
Well, we're going to pray together. And, um, <clears throat> you know, prayer is a real privilege, isn't it? It's a privilege to be able to pray. And it's, it's an amazing gift that we, we have that we can talk to God about anything, anytime. So I'm going to pray and I'm going to leave a space and you might want to pray out loud or quietly and then I'm going to say something else. I'll leave some spaces for you if you want to pray out loud or if you want to pray quietly. That's fine. So let's pray together. <clears throat> King of kings, Lord of lords, thank you that you are great and abundant in power and love. Your understanding is beyond measure. You are the God who can do all things. You reign over us all with love, mercy and grace. Lord, bless this fellowship. Make your face shine upon us. Help us to keep reaching out into our community, making friends and sharing your love. Thank you that you have plans for us all, plans that are good and for your glory. to resolve it um, so that these places become places of peace not places of war mm -hmm. so I just lift those places all around the world to you Lord I just ask this in Jesus name mm -hmm. we pray for those Lord of our fellowship and wider family who are sick, unwell, and suffering at this time, we pray for a touch of your healing hand, for your comfort, and for your presence with them now. Thank you for those who have known your healing. Lord, thank you that there is nowhere we can go from your presence. May we be filled with the desire to support and encourage one another in love. May your peace be in our hearts, we pray. In all things, Lord, we pray that your will will be done. We give you our thanks and praise. And we praise your glorious name.
And then we pray for Chris now as he comes to speak to us. Fill him with your spirit, Lord. Bring those right words that we need to hear. Help us remember what we've heard, Lord. And we thank you for Chris, for all he does for us, for the word he brings us in a way that we can understand and for the challenges he sets in front of us. Now, Amen. Ourselves. <clears throat> you know how some cars have seats that have got automatic settings? You just press setting one, setting two. I think that's what we really need, isn't it? Lectern setting one, setting two. Oh, that's a bit high even for me now, never mind. <laughs> um, I've overdone it. Good morning, welcome, and welcome if you're watching us online. Thanks for joining us this morning. Uh, in this series, we've been exploring Jesus' healing miracles as described in John's Gospel. The point of doing this is to help us experience more of God's healing power today. Last week, uh, we were thinking about Jesus healing the royal official's son. And I highlighted three aspects of that story. If you want to know more about that, then perhaps catch up on that last week's sermon online. But I talked about that phrase that Jesus used. Unless you people see signs, you'll never believe. We saw that Jesus healed at a distance. Even when he was physically present in one place, he could heal somewhere else. And we thought about the fact that <coughs> Jesus didn't do what the royal official asked. He didn't go with him, but he did do what he needed, which was to bring his son healing. We thought a bit about the journey of faith that that royal official had gone on from humbling himself to go to Jesus rather than summoning him through to calling him Lord and then doing what he asked and then as he went home testifying about what Jesus had done and declaring that it was indeed a miracle. We thought about the way that his belief in Jesus as Lord and Saviour removed the obstacles for healing to come. So without that belief in Jesus, healing couldn't flow. But once he'd trusted in Jesus as Lord and Saviour, that cleared the way for Jesus to do what he wanted, which was to bring healing. And we thought about that witness that the official brought and the impact that it had on the whole household, leading them to believe in the Lord and Saviour, I contrasted that with the ten lepers. You remember when Jesus healed ten lepers and only one came back to give thanks. <coughs> and Andrew Dalwood kindly contacted me during the week with a further observation. He said this, healing must be followed by thankfulness. And you mentioned the ten lepers. But what about the royal official and his family? We know who the royal official probably was because his name turns up in Luke's Gospel in chapter 8, verse 3, as Tutor, manager of Herod's household. And he had a wife, Joanna, who must have been more than thankful for the recovery of her son. And her thankfulness was expressed materially, as we find that she and others bankrolled Jesus' ministry out of their own means. Surely a grateful mother acknowledging the gift of her son restored to life and health by Jesus. What a great observation. Thanks, Andrew. That's, and it is really important, isn't it? The way we respond to Jesus' healing matters. And we saw that in this morning's reading. The man didn't respond in the way that Jesus told him to. Despite Jesus' warning, the healed man went and told the Jewish authorities that it was Jesus that had made him well. And that led to Jesus being persecuted. Uh, which didn't stop Jesus healing him. Even though he knew that that was going to be the consequence, it didn't stop him healing him. But I am getting ahead of myself. So, thinking about this passage. There are some obvious contrasts between this healing and the one we studied last week. This healing is set in Jerusalem, 
at the time of the festival and there's loads of people there. Um, last week we were up in the hills, out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and last week the sun lay dying, uh, but it was, we think, a relatively recent thing, a fever. And people do sometimes recover from fevers. The miraculous nature of the healing was the timing of the recovery. Remember, it was at the exact moment that Jesus said, your son will live, that he got better. In this case, the paralyzed man, the length of time the man has been paralyzed makes it impossible that this healing is a coincidence. Just happened to happen that day after 38 years. Last week, the official went to great lengths to go to Jesus, and he begged him to heal his son. In this week's reading, the paralyzed man never actually asked Jesus to heal him. It looks like Jesus went to the pool to see what was going on there. And whilst he's there, he's filled with compassion for this man and decides to heal him. After 38 years, one might think that Jesus could have waited a few more hours so as not to outrage the Pharisees who believed he was breaking the Sabbath by healing and commanding the man to carry his mat on the Sabbath. Jesus might respond that 38 years is long enough. Why should he have to suffer any longer? It seems to me that Jesus was being deliberately provocative like he went looking for someone to heal on the Sabbath to make a point. Because his actions bring to the surface the lack of compassion of the Jewish leaders and their lack of belief in him as son of God. When defending his authority to heal on the Sabbath, Jesus declared, I know that you do not have the love of God in your hearts. And I think this is what he's bringing to the surface. You know, if they really cared about that man, they would be more interested in his comment that he'd been healed than that he was carrying his mat. But they're obsessed with the mat and miss the fact that he's been healed after 38 years. So Jesus brought that to the surface and they recognized that by claiming authority over the Sabbath, Jesus was making himself equal with God Jesus describes God as his father and that he's only doing what his father does. So whilst this man never asked to be healed, faith's still involved. And faith is once more demonstrated by simple obedience to Jesus' command. Like the royal official, the paralyzed man does what Jesus tells him to do. Jesus commands him to pick up his mat. He picks up his mat. Notice he doesn't even know Jesus' name. He just recognises Jesus' authority to command him. So the faith of obedience clears the way for him to be made whole. As we noted already, the man's response was rather negative, rather than the positive outcome of last week, and yet Jesus still chose to heal him. So I want to highlight three things. You'll be noting a pattern here, deep in my Baptist upbringing. You've got to have three points. They don't all start with the same letter. What can I say? Uh, so, but this one really struck me. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie. The blind, the, blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. Secondly, do you want to get well? Jesus asked him. And finally, See, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. So first, here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame and the paralysed. So Jesus walks into a place where there are a great number of disabled people, including other paralysed people. He walks past them. It appears that Jesus healed just one of them. How did the rest feel? This man walks in. He walks up to one person. 
who's been lying there for 38 years, pretty much everyone must have known who he was and what his problem was, and suddenly he stands up and walks out carrying his mat. They must have been amazed at the healing, but what about themselves? Did they all clamour, heal me next, heal me next? It doesn't say so. Jesus surely wanted all the sick people to be well, and he had power to heal them all. So why did he heal this one and not the rest? John doesn't say. And I suspect that's because he doesn't know. But he includes this detail because he wants us to understand the mystery of Jesus' healing. The man who was healed had been an invalid for 38 years. Had he never prayed before? Had he never said, God, heal me. I can't sort this out myself. Heal me. Did he never come to that point? Surely he's been praying throughout that time. And how might he feel that he's been healed now, after 38 years? when the best years of his life are now behind him and he's missed out on so much of life. It's problematic, isn't it? Is it just me? It, it raises questions, deep questions about when God heals, why God heals, who God heals. When Moses asked to see the Lord's glory, God said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Exodus 33:19. When the Apostle Paul is reflecting on the sovereignty of God, he recalls this verse and exclaims, What then shall we say? Is God unjust? Not at all. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. It does not therefore depend on human desire or effort, but on God's mercy. That's from Romans chapter 9, 14 to 16. Paul there is talking about salvation that it doesn't depend on human desire or effort, but on God's mercy. But I think it's the same with healing. It's not about how much the man wanted to be healed, but on <coughs> God's mercy. It isn't that God was unjust to the others that were there, but he showed compassion to this one. So doesn't it matter at all what the, uh, how the man felt about this? Well, yes, it does, because Jesus asked him, do you want to get well? The man never actually directly answers that question, but his tone must have given Jesus the answer that he needed. He did long to be healed. And God won't force his way into our lives to bring us salvation or healing. He wants us to invite him to come. The man may have felt that Jesus was condemning him for not making more effort to get healed. Because he is a little bit defensive, isn't he? he said, well, you know, I can't get in the water in time. You know? There was this strange belief that if the water bubbled, at that moment you could find healing. Jesus never validates that. He doesn't address that at all. He simply addresses the man and says, do you want to get well? But it sounds a little bit defensive. In reality, I don't think Jesus is condemning him. I think he's trying to lead him to the point of faith, bringing him to the point of daring to hope again. Asking him, do you want to be healed, brings to the thought into his mind, hmm, do I hope for that? Do I still hope that God might heal me? He admits his need, and then he demonstrates his willingness to obey Jesus as Lord by doing what he commands. He picks up his mat and walks off with it. 
He wants to be healed enough to do what Jesus says. As we thought about the royal official and this man, we see that Jesus touches on some sensitive areas in our lives to bring about healing, not only of body, but of emotions, will and spirit. Unless you people see signs, you'll never believe. Do you want to be healed? They're not the sort of things that people invite you to say at sensitivity training. These are things that are rather insensitive. Jesus is touching on painful areas in order to bring healing. So the third point. The man goes off, he meets with the um, officials, the Jewish leaders in the temple, and they ask him who healed him. He doesn't know, so he goes about his business. And then Jesus meets him and says to him, see, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. Just a short aside, it's interesting, isn't it, that the man didn't know Jesus' name, you couldn't find him anywhere but Jesus found him. That gives me hope. You know, there's a lot of people that that are trying to find Jesus and they can't find him. People were saying to me that last night, people were saying, I'd love to believe, but I can't. They can't find their way to Jesus. But Jesus can find them. Jesus found him in the crowd of a Jewish festival (coughs) at the temple. You've ever walked into a football ground? and tried to find somebody in the crowd. It's very difficult to find one person in a crowd. Jewish festival, the temple, it's going to be very, very busy. Jesus finds it, no trouble at all. Has a conversation with him. Warns him. This was a place, the temple was a place that he hadn't been able to go for 38 years. I don't know if you perhaps picked up on that, but... If you know your Old Testament well, you know that you couldn't go into the temple if you were blind, lame, paralyzed, or in any way disabled. You were just banned from going in. Now he can go in. And he's gone to the temple. After 38 years, he's gone to the temple. Why has he gone to the temple? It can only be to say thank you, can't it? He's gone to say, I'm healed. I want to worship God again with all of the throng of people that are going. I want to come and give my thanks. And he meets Jesus at the temple. So he's well, yet there's another side to this. He needs to stop sinning or something worse might happen. What could be worse than being paralyzed for 38 years? We think about this man's life and some of the things that are coming out, just the few things that we hear. The man blamed others for the fact he hadn't found healing. Nobody gets me into the water. Others get in before me. Despite Jesus warning him, he still blamed Jesus for making him carry his mat on the Sabbath. And whilst what he says is true, it does sort of lack balance, doesn't it? He doesn't sort of say, well, yeah, okay, all right. The mat, okay? I understand you've got a theological problem with the mat. But I was paralysed for 38 years and now I'm walking around. Doesn't that give you pause for thought about who he might be? No, he doesn't say that. He says, oh, Jesus told me to do it. Yeah. Causing a bit of a problem, isn't it? I think he has a problem with taking responsibility. You might say that his suffering has led him to that character flaw because his condition made him dependent on others. But part of wanting to be well is being willing to take responsibility for himself now. I like to think that the man later went on to believe more fully in Jesus and regretted blaming him for healing him on the Sabbath. Jesus' death in his place, Jesus' resurrection, must have had a profound effect on him. As he saw the consequences, 
of telling the Jewish authorities on the man who had healed him. It must have brought him to repentance, I hope. It made me pause to think that sometimes the Lord takes us to a place where we see for ourselves our character flaws in order for us to come to him and say, yes, Lord, I need you to do something about that. And that's certainly the case in my life. The Lord brings me to the end of myself. I step over a mark that even I think that wasn't right, and then I have to deal with it. So how do we apply all of this into our lives? Well, we think about here are a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. Here this morning, here online this, today, are a great number of people who need healing, aren't there? I mean, I could ask you to raise your hand if you're completely fit and healthy, because I guess most of us need something this morning. Jesus desires everyone to be well. He has the power to heal every disease and disability. Yet, he may choose to heal only one. That doesn't mean that he loves that person more than he loves you, or that that person had more faith than you, or will serve Jesus more effectively than you. It only means that grace is grace, it is undeserved. In our life group discussion uh, this week, um, someone asked a really helpful question. They said, during Jesus' ministry, it seems that everybody that went to Jesus was healed. And yet, today, when we come to the Holy Spirit, not everyone that comes to the Holy Spirit and asks to be healed is healed. That's a great question, isn't it? Um, well, let me try and unpack that. So, firstly, Jesus said that he did what he saw the Father doing. He only did those things which he saw the Father doing. So, he didn't heal everyone. He healed those whom he saw the Father calling him to heal. It may be that um, the Spirit blinded the eyes of those that weren't ready to be healed or that the Father didn't want to be healed at the moment, so they didn't ask. It may be that they didn't have the faith to ask because they weren't in that right place to be healed. So there may be reasons why um, not everybody went to Jesus to ask for healing. Uh, secondly, you have to think about the New Testament, you know, the, the rest of the New Testament after the Gospels. How does it start unfolding after Jesus has risen from the dead? They see healing miracles, absolutely. Again and again, we see the Apostle Paul healing people. We see, he sees they have faith to be healed and he heals them of illnesses and diseases. Yet, Paul goes to the Father and says, heal me, three times, and three times he's told, my grace is sufficient. So, we have to accept that after the resurrection of Jesus, not everyone who asks to be healed is healed. So why is that? Well, we know that when Jesus returns, there will be no more sickness, no more dying, no more mourning, no more war. All of those things will end. Between now and then, there will still be sickness and dying and grieving and war and earthquakes and all of those things until the Lord comes again. So we live in that time between Jesus' resurrection and his coming again. During this period, the coming forward into our time of the end times, when there will be healing, is brought about by the Holy Spirit. When Jesus walked amongst us physically, he said, the kingdom of God is among you. Now he calls us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, because it isn't. So that's why we're praying to bring into this time God's kingdom and his authority. So yes, we pray, as Paul did. Jesus has power and authority to heal. And I would reckon, well, we can discuss it when we get to heaven, but I reckon there are more people being healed today than there were in Jesus' day by God. Because 
Jesus was only healing the people around him where he was. Now, there are Christians all over the world this morning, millions and millions of them praying for others to be healed. If only a small fraction of those are healed, there's probably tens of thousands of people that are experiencing healing this morning. That's wonderful, isn't it? That's a wonderful thing. Jesus promised you will do even greater things than I've done. And I think that's one of the ways that that works out. So why, why might that be? Because the kingdom has not yet fully come. And we see that throughout Paul's writings where he talks about uh, how going through suffering and enduring leads to character and hope. So let's move to the next part. Do you want to get well? So Jesus doesn't heal everyone who wants to get well, but he will not heal those who do not want to get well. Shall I say that again? Jesus does not heal everyone who wants to get well, but he will not heal those who do not want to get well. He won't force his mercy on anyone. Jesus might pose an equally challenging question to you today. Sometimes we need to see that our behaviour is wrong before we come to Jesus to find repentance and healing. Literally what Jesus asks is, do you want to be whole? Not, not with well, perhaps, doesn't quite say that. It might just mean not sick. But do you want to be whole? New Testament's written in Greek, but the thought world behind it is Hebrew. In Hebrew, in Hebrew thought, wholeness and healing are the same word. Shalom, wholeness and healing, they come together. So we, if we want to be whole, then we can find peace. But we have to find wholeness in order to find peace. So it's not just about having this bit or that bit fixed, but the whole of our life coming under God's lordship. I, I was thinking, um, just as I was waiting to, to, to speak, about the rich young ruler um, and he, he says, you know, how he's been obeying the commands. Uh, and Jesus says, well, okay, if you want to be perfect or whole, then give everything you have to the poor. It's the same sort of thinking, that, that when we come for healing, Jesus is asking, okay, you want a healing in this area of your life, but are you putting the whole of your life under my authority? Do you want to be whole? So sometimes we are the barrier to our own healing. Not always, but sometimes. See, you're well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. Jesus asked, do you want to be well? Literally, do you want to be whole? Then he sees the man again and he says, see, you are whole again. But it seems that being whole and remaining whole is more complex than it might appear to us. So sickness and disability entered the world through sin, not necessarily the individual sin, but the fall from the beginning of creation. We all suffer from that separation that sin puts between creation and its creator. Not every disability or sickness is the result of personal sin. Though we can see obvious causal connections in the physical reign between our behaviours and our health, most notably something like smoking. We know there's a causal connection between how we behave and whether we develop lung cancer. The two things are connected causally. And spiritually, the same is true. There are certain behaviours that are more likely to lead us to ill health. In a healing, in healing generally, but in a healing we'll see later in the series, um, Jesus declares that the man's blindness, he was born blind, was not due to his personal sin or his family's sin. In that case, the man was healed for God's glory. In this case, Jesus tells him to stop sinning, to remain whole. There is a connection. So our wholeness is more than being physically well, and it involves a, tra a transformation of our mind, heart, and body. I wonder if the man was still listening, uh, because Jesus goes on to say later in this passage, 
verse 24. Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but will cross over from death to life. Very truly, I tell you, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given authority to, to him to judge because he is the Son of Man. Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to life. Those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. I wonder if the healed man heard that and understood those promises. That is what would be worse than being paralysed for 38 years, being condemned to eternity separated from God. So hearing Jesus' words, recognising through them that he is Son of God, leads us to fullness of life, now and for eternity. How are we going to respond to that this morning? Do you want to get well? i will ask this to you personally. And remember, the question is, do you want to be whole? Do you want to be whole, right with God in every way? I don't need to tell me, but I'd like to tell God. Do you want to be whole? That's a personal question. Let me ask you this. Do you want the gift of healing to be manifest week after week here in Burwell Baptist Church? You probably said to God that you did want his healing. You did want to be whole. But what about the person next to you? Do you want them to have the opportunity to be whole? For them to come into that experience of God's healing. Remember, Jesus walked amongst many people that needed healing and one was healed. Do you long for that to be happening here week after week? People receiving that healing. I know you're a compassionate bunch and I'm pretty certain that you're saying yes. Yes, Chris, we want that to happen. Okay, this is my challenging question. What's going to make that more likely? We've seen that it's down to God's mercy. It's down to his grace. But it's also about us clearing the way with our faith, creating an environment where people are able to spend time in God's presence, listening to him. Very often at the end of the service, people have got to that point where they're saying, yes, Lord, just need to listen to you to hear what I need to do to find that healing. And you know what happens? We have a chat. And it's yabba 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 yabba. And because of that, that person can't carry on that conversation with God. They never receive that healing that they need. If we genuinely want people to be experiencing God's healing, we've got to give that space for God to move. And I understand. You know, I, I completely understand. You're sitting next to somebody. How are you? It's a perfectly reasonable question. And sometimes we have to make that connection, don't we? You don't want people to go out without having connected with the body of Christ. But can I ask that the next question is, would you like to come through to have a cup of coffee with me and continue the conversation? Or would you like somebody to pray with you? rather than continue the conversation. Because if one starts talking, then another speaks louder, and very soon, it's very loud. And you just can't hear the person that's asking you to pray for them. So that's my practical question. If we genuinely want God to be healing people, are we prepared to make that sacrifice? To just say, come through, chat with me next door, Let's leave this space for people to worship God and to pray. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you do indeed walk among us with the power to heal today. Wow, that is wonderful to know, Lord. We thank you for the testimonies that have been of your healing. We thank you for the prophetic words that have brought freedom 
and help people to know your presence. We thank you that you're here today to heal. And we pray, Holy Spirit of God, pour out your healing power upon us. If only one is healed today, what joy there would be in our midst, Lord, that you had reached out your hand out of mercy and grace and healed. And we pray, Lord, that week by week, that awesome power would lead to a holiness in this place, a holy awe of you, looking again expectantly for you to heal, for you to restore, for you to save in this place. Lord, that is our heart's desire. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm going to hand back to Pete, who's going to continue to lead us in worship. Yeah, yeah. I'm just thinking, can we just have that response back up there, Andy? Just with your moments. Sorry. I'm just thinking, if we, you know, just have a few moments to sort of contemplate and, and ponder on that, that might just. Um, just stir something in you that you might want to come and share, because this is a time where if, if you want to come and share something, <coughs> here's the mic, it's here. <coughs> Thank you. It might be something not to do with this at all. Your heart might be going really fast, and that's a good indication that God wants you to get up and, and share something. You might want somebody... Um, to pray with you perhaps when we have our, our worship you might just want to come to the front where the chairs are as an indication does anybody want to come and share anything give us a word it might be something that you're thinking what? why have I got that in my head that's nothing at all but it <coughs> might be something that somebody needs to hear it might be confirmation for somebody for a particular situation Uh, yesterday I had a terrible backache uh, in my lower back all day <clears throat> and Karen and I were out in Newmarket <coughs> last night and I'm guessing that Shona prayed for me before I went out. Well I think you did. Yeah. <laughs> and I didn't think about a backache all evening, it was fine. And, um, you perhaps ought to say why you and Karen with the new mark you sound like <laughs> Oh yeah, 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 sorry. Sorry for those who don't know, Karen and I were out town pastoring on the street last night. And um, walking on those hard pavements can make your back hurt a bit. But last night I was absolutely fine for about three hours walking. So Yeah, so that was smashing. Thank you. Anybody else want to come and <coughs> share something with us? <coughs> from you. Well, Pete's going to lead us um, in some worship. I'm not sure what we're singing, but I'm sure if you want to come up in between the songs, Pete will see you and, and we'll wait for you. As I said before, if you want to come and have somebody praying with you, you can. Um, if you don't want to carry on a worship, that's fine. Come through because I think refreshments will be served soon. So just to sort of repeating what Chris has said, if you want to have a chat, that's brilliant. Do it in there. If you want to pray, do it in here. Well, actually, you could pray in there as well, but you know what I mean. You know what I mean. So, Pete, I'm just going to hand over to you. But please, I encourage you, anybody who wants to come up and share, just come up and wait here and Pete will wait for you. Thank you, Pete.
share with us anything you might want to uh, remind us of you might have a Bible reading you want to share this would be a good time if that's what you feel you'd like to do
Come to me, all who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I don't think Jesus just meant that we should carry the burden of illness and sickness and pain, because I do believe it's a burden. So I'd encourage you to do exactly that. Come all who are heavily laden and burdened, and he will give you rest.